Hey y'all, Uncle Jimmy here. When you speak for yourself, you're forced to think for yourself. And when you think for yourself, the sports world looks different. In order to enjoy this podcast and this show, you need to have the courage to look at the world from alternative points of view and not be offended when you disagree. Speak for Yourself isn't your Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram feed. SFY tells you what you need to hear and not what you want to hear. So, welcome aboard, buckle up, and enjoy the ride. We start today with the Browns. Cleveland Browns represent what's wrong with modern American culture. What's that? We cater to kids. We want to be their best friends more than we want to be their mentors, their voice of authority, their unbending, guiding light. You want to understand why Baker Mayfield is regressing from his promising rookie season, why Odell Beckham Jr. has been a shadow of his former self, and why the Browns got boat raced 31-3 to by the 49ers last night? Lord. They're spoiled. Baker Mayfield and Odell Beckham Jr. The brat pack of football. Hmm. All right, let me explain. Freddie Kitchens had virtually no qualifications to be named head coach of an NFL franchise. The Browns elevated Kitchens over interim coach Greg Williams because the Haslams and general manager John Dorsey thought it would please their bratty quarterback. After the Browns fired 2018 head coach Hugh Jackson and offensive coordinator Todd Haley, Kitchens and Mayfield became BFF when Kitchens called plays the final eight games of last season. The 44-year-old Kitchens had never been more than a position coach before those eight games. His buddy-buddy relationship with Mayfield during Cleveland's 5-3 and three finish was Kitchens' main qualification for head coach. Kitchens is then over his head trying to orchestrate Cleveland's offense while still learning to be an NFL head coach, especially the coach of a team with two of the highest profile personalities in the league. Last night, Kitchens cooked up a game plan intended to satisfy and showcase Beckham Jr. Beckham had just two catches in Cleveland's Week 3 victory over the Ravens. Mm. Kitchens began the process of apologizing for Beckham's lack of productivity immediately following that game when he complained to the media that a Ravens defender appeared to choke Beckham. Freddie wanted everyone to know he had OBJ's back. Kitchens doubled down last night. His offensive priority wasn't beating the 49ers. The priority was featuring Beckham. Cleveland opened with Beckham throwing a pass to Jarvis Landry. The next play was a throw to Beckham in the flat. Beckham dropped the ball. Ooh. Kitchens called two running plays for Beckham. And in the fourth quarter, with the game out of hand, Kitchens allowed Beckham to return a punt. Beckham made a mess of the return and fumbled the ball to the 49ers. Baker and Beckham have turned the Browns into a circus of arrogance and whining. When Baker isn't feuding with the media or his former coaches, OBJ is whining and playing the victim. The NFL won't let him wear watches or, or the visor he wants. Greg Williams told his defensive players to hit me hard. Hmm. The Browns are a hot mess, and it starts with their two brats, Baker and Beckham. This pairing isn't going to work. One of these problem children needs to be given up for adoption. All right, joining the desk now are Fox Sports NFL mm. analyst LeVar Arrington and Fox Sports college football analyst Reggie Bush, Marcellus, I'll start with you. Yeah. Too early to say Baker and Odell are a bad pairing. I do think it's too early. Um, they lack consistency. <clears throat> it's just that simple. It's a team right now that will go out there, lose, win, lose, win, lose. And that's where they are right now in that roller coaster, trying to find that chemistry that they're lacking in part because of their offseason, because of the lack of consistency they had in terms of working together, yep. OBJ, respect. Speak to it. Go yeah, ahead. speak to it. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I used to love working out by myself as well, but I had an independent position. Yeah. It was me, the trenches, and the offense alignment. Handle business, Wiley. Mm -hmm. You're different. You're dependent out there when you're a wide receiver. You need chemistry. You need to learn that unspoken language. And him and Baker do not speak the same language right now. So OBJ is going to be extremely frustrated. Baker and his miseries, he can place them all on himself. Mm -hmm. Not OBJ. OBJ goes home, looks in the mirror, and is like, is Baker going to show up too? Because he's part of this problem. Right. And that's a sad place because the internal fighting will start and the frustration will brew over. They're in a bad place, but it's not horrible because they still have a lot of football to play. Yeah, and I think they have a culture issue right now because there's no way they should got to dominate it the way they did last night. They got beat in every phase of that football game, offense, defense. I mean, forget about the line of scrimmage. They ran the football right down Cleveland Browns' defensive throat. Um, the offensive line 
one line of scrimmage. And so th there's no way they should get dominated like that with that much talent mm. on the field. And I don't know if Freddie Kitchens is the right man for the job, right? Mm. Because I can go on there and call some dope plays for Odell Beckham Jr., Jarvis Landry, you got Nick Chubb back there who's waiting and screaming for you, run the football, funnel the offense through the run game. Right now they're trying to be a pass first team, and Baker's not ready for that yet. So help him out, right? Make it, simplify it for him. Give him a good run game, which you already got that behind him, mm -hmm. and then get to the play action passes, and then get to Odell and Jarvis. That's the way, from right, oh, at least from what I see, that's the way it has to work. Do what they did. The, in week three against Baltimore. Run, yes. Yeah, do what they Run did. Run the football. But trust me, OBJ wasn't happy, and that's why they came out mm. with a different game plan. And that's why it's been a bad pairing from day one. And listen, you have a, a leader in Jarvis Landry, right? He seems to be the most mature and the guy that they tend to look for for that leadership value. <clears throat> but when you have a baby at quarterback and you bring in, and I said this Ooh. so many times, is that when you bring in a guy with the, the brand and 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 – the, the, the mystique that, that OBJ is bringing into Cleveland and into that organization, you got to have a quarterback that can handle the amount of limelight that's coming into that locker room. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for Baker Mayfield, he is not at the maturation process or, or, or place in his career at this early in time where I think he was prepared to be able to handle what was coming his way. Mm -hmm. A leader at quarterback would be able to manage the situation and say, hey, we're not going to do a double pass with OBJ. We're going to run the ball. This is what we're going to do. We're going to funnel our, our run, uh, our offense through the run and, and get to the passing game. I can handle this in the passing game. This is how we should be approaching it. There should be feedback coming from your quarterback that is, is really encouraging and empowering your offensive coordinator, your head coach, yeah. to do the right thing with the rest of this this group but it's being dictated from somewhere else and and it may be not even OBJ's fault it may be his reputation that preceded him mm -hmm. but you have to have the proper leadership and I think that's what makes it a bad pairing I think the personality aspects are getting highlighted when the production is not there mm -hmm. so I think we all fit well in the locker room that's winning right you know I mean <laughs> when we balling out of control dog your differences are yours yeah uh but when we're losing then your differences are my problem mm -hmm. and that's the issue right here so his mental makeup in terms of Baker Bay Mayfield I don't see that at play what I see at play is one they went against a 49ers defense that you can't really run the ball on that's yeah. the only team in the NFL who hasn't allowed a rushing touchdown this season so Maybe Freddie Kitch is saying we probably want to get away from the running game just because of this team. This is a balanced team. The only team in the NFL that's top five in offense and defense. So you have to respect that maybe he was a little too cute, but in part it's because you're looking at the film and you're realizing – not a lot of opportunities to exploit this team. They're yeah. very balanced. So, But you can't use that as, as, as an argument point when you've brought in the type of talent that they brought yeah. into Cleveland. You, I can't, you, you, still, you, can't be you still have to go out there and throw down. I don't care if they haven't mm -hmm. allowed a runner. I, I, I recall mm -hmm. us going into a game against Michigan State. We didn't allow a runner over 100 yards, and they had two go over 200 yards on one <laughs> <Yeah>. game. <laughs> I mean, it, they proved the theory wrong. Right, right? Right. If you come in with the type of players and the, the firepower that Cleveland's coming in with, you got you got to press that issue. I don't, I'm not coming in here based off of what your ranking is as a defense. Yeah. I'm going to come in here with a game plan knowing that I got a guy, I got a couple guys y'all can't cover on the outsides. Yeah. I'm going to mix this run in because your defense has got to choose one or the two. Mm -hmm. Bottom line. And they did not do that. And that's not well, happening right my, now. My concern would just be if we look at the emotional energy the opposition has towards Baker Mayfield, mm. you're exposing him when you go to that uh, passing game the way that they did, Nick Bosa and these guys ate that offensive lineup. Oh and we've God. seen Ooh. Baker, the game before Baltimore, we kept seeing Baker with happy feet and bailing out of the mm -hmm. pocket. Yeah. And then they went to the running game to s calm him down. And now they just reverted back. Yeah. And th that's where I just go, this isn't me trying to beat up on OBJ. I do think OBJ and Baker are both immature. But if you're going to have a, a OBJ, it's like LeVar says, man, you better be rock solid at yeah. the quarterback position or that's an inferno that's going to blaze out of control. Mm. Yeah, 100%. And then on top of that, like when I look at the end of the game, right, Odell carrying the ball like he's Walter Payton, like Odell's one of my boys. And I would sit here, if he was, if he was sitting right next to me, tell him, come on, bro, you know you cannot do that, right? And so 
To me, it's a trickle-down effect because Baker, loose with the football in the pocket. Mm. Then what does it do? It translates to other guys on the team being loose with the football in the pocket, and that speaks to the culture and the leadership issue that they have right now. Yeah. All right, let's transition solely to Baker Mayfield. Here we go. Anybody concerned <laughs> yet that he will not make it as a franchise quarterback? He was the number one overall pick. That guy is supposed to be headed for greatness. Yeah. Any reason for concern? Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I will say that him being the number one overall pick, uh, that, that caught me off guard, as many people. But who am I to say anything to a guy who has this beautiful arrogance that yeah. walked on to two different college campuses and walked off as a Heisman Trophy winner? Mm -hmm. So I had to bow down to whatever level of belief he had in himself. But... The wise ones of our league, the veterans will always tell you, no matter what your top layer is in terms of persona and personality, that bottom layer has to be professionalism mm -hmm. and respect for the game. And kind of like the duck's feet under the water. They have to be working in a professional manner. Here's the thing. When I look at Baker Mayfield and then I hear a Rex Ryan come out who's seen more football than probably all of us, and he says, this is a one-read quarterback. Now, Rex Ryan can take shots that anybody wants to, but he always has something of substance to support it when he does take that yeah, shot. Yeah. That caught me as well. And then I start to look at Baker Mayfield and that beautiful arrogance, and I'm like, it's not working at this level. Mm -hmm. It's not. Mm -hmm. Because, one, as Whitlock just pointed out, you're getting everybody riled up. Now, the only way to fight that and counter that is, oh, I'm about these fundamentals, I'm about this chemistry, yep. and I'm about this leadership. Yep. And when you have those boxes checked, then the personality could come out. But when it's not, that's where I find him right now. I have a great concern for Baker Mayfield if he doesn't correct his course, because right now it's a recipe for disaster. But don't you think there needs to be somebody in, in, in the coaching staff that can help him to get to that level? Right? Because whoever is there obviously is not getting the job done, right? Mm -hmm. And obviously the play calling is not supporting what we should be seeing on the football field, because last year when when – when Baker took over, he looked different than he does right now. That's so, the same coach. <laughs> that's, huh? the, that's the same coach. Is it the same coach. coach? Freddie Kitchens was there. Was the offensive, the offensive coordinator, coordinator, but he was not yeah. the head coach. And that's why that's I very think different. the power yeah. dynamic is off is because Baker was instrumental in Freddie getting that job. Yeah. That job should have went to Greg Williams. Quite yeah. He 100%, earned it. It should have went to Greg Williams. Williams. But because of the relationship and BFF with Baker, he gets that job. And that's why I think he has a hard time at this time checking Baker Mayfield. Yeah, I don't, I don't see him. It's going to be difficult for him to transition from being the, the college talent that he was into being a franchise quarterback in the NFL. Mm -hmm. All right, so is there a concern? Uh, if, if you thought he was going to be a franchise quarterback, there has to be a concern. I, I'm, I'm more of the thought process, you have to prove that you're a franchise quarterback. I don't, I don't look at anybody and say, oh, he's not going to be a franchise <laughs> quarterback. Like he, like, he has to prove that, and he hasn't shown he's a, a franchise guy yet. Now, the problem that he's facing, it's not going to be talent. It's, it's not even going to be what's between his, his, his ears. It's going to come down to what Reggie was t uh, touching on earlier, is how is he being developed? Yeah. All right, there are a ton, and I'll even put myself on that list. There are a ton of guys that have come from being mega stars at the college level, yeah. and because they went to the, the, the wrong franchise, you are going to waste your, your most formative years trying to figure out the best you can for yourself. How do I become the type of pro that I'm supposed to become? Mm -hmm. Because you don't have that type of guidance. It's happened so many times. Name me the last time uh, a high draft pick as, as a quarterback went to Cleveland and actually was in a, a part of a culture and, and a franchise, an organization that actually developed a franchise quarterback at that position. I'll wait. <laughs> yeah, we ain't got that much I'll time. Wait. Okay, yeah, we ain't got that yeah, much yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So the reality of it is, is if you're looking at what he's facing, what we just debated with what Kitchens is not doing, he's not a Phil Jackson in, in this Chicago Bulls type of uh, setting. So, and he's not a leader himself. He's not a Michael Jordan to Scottie Pippen or to Dennis Rodman or yeah. Horace Grant, right? So if you don't have that makeup, he does not, it, it's not even a concern as to whether he can be a franchise quarterback. It's a, it's a matter of how how good can he be and and can he have a a good pro career without that type of development or structure in place and so it's, it kind of falls into something that was con concerns me about Jalen Hurts right 
the, the concerning thing to me is that Jalen Hurts is not going to have Lincoln Riley the rest of his career because when he does get drafted and makes it to the NFL, somebody may not be ready to fit him into the system the way that, that worked did. well for him yep. in college. Mm -hmm. Same thing for Baker. He doesn't have Lincoln Riley, that system that elevated him and that showcased what he does well in, at the in yeah. professional level. I'm not letting him off the hook like that because everything you guys say – is applicable to the NFL experience. But I don't think that tells the entire picture or the real picture. The real picture is the top quarterbacks go to the worst teams. Yep. That's how we reward. We reward you at the top of the draft <laughs> for being sorry. Right. So most of the top quarterbacks who come into the NFL if that make it, we're on some sorry teams yeah. that turn their course around. Now, Bill Belichick, the greatest coach of all time, was a losing head coach. Five of his first six seasons, including five. In Cleveland. In Cleveland. <laughs> now... The whole Belichick-Brady argument. Who made who? Yeah. The point of it is, the quarterback, there's an onus on you to make your coach as well if you're a franchise quarterback. So, to me, your point, but me and he's Tom, not a franchise quarterback. Me and Brady were in the same draft, and, and I was long gone. I was, I was on a private jet and on a helicopter long before Tom Brady had even gotten drafted in that draft. The reality of it is, is that Tom Brady didn't have to save Belichick. He didn't come into a situation that Baker Mayfield has come into. Mm -hmm. He had an opportunity to develop in a system. Mm -hmm. And once he had an opportunity, now he made the best of it. And who knows, you know, he, he would be able to speak to that best. But the reality of it is, is when you're talking about a high draft pick that does go to one of these, these poor uh, type of uh, franchises, it, it's unfortunate, but you do not see those guys generally pan out and materialize. Name them. Let's name who has had success oh, I'm gonna give as you a top a, guy. I, I'm going to give you a guy, different franchise, different situation, because I think what Baker is experiencing, not only does he go to a poor franchise, but then instantly that franchise goes into win-now mode mm -hmm. right after his rookie season. Mm. I don't think you do that that early with a young quarterback. Skip Peyton Manning took yep. his lumps in Indianapolis. Yes, he did. And, 13. And, and they yes. grew together as an organization. Mm. And th that was yes. fast. I was there. Yes, yes. Peyton Manning threw 28 interceptions, uh, 20 of them against us Buffalo Bills, my team, 3-13. Uh, and 13. Next year, they were 13-3. and three. Yeah. I don't know what kind of growth spurt that is, but we're not going to see that out. <laughs> but he had leadership. What I, what, yeah. my, my point is that if Peyton Manning had been dealing with Marvin Harrison on one side and Chris Carter on the other, that could stunt your growth because, like, those guys are ready to eat right now. Yeah. And I mean, he's he in the learning Marshall, process. He had Marshall Falk in them there. But, no, no, no. But, 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 again, I'm talking about the receiver and the way receiver but here's yeah, the difference. Yeah, yeah. But here's the that. difference. Even with that being said, the difference is leadership. Yeah. If you have a guy, Chris Carter and Randy Moss yeah. had a, a young guy and, and, and Dante Culpepper. And they had Dennis Green, a very experienced wow. coach. Absolutely. Not Absolutely. Freddie Kitchens, a guy learning on the job. And I'll agree with that, but there was still a lot of leadership and guidance that came from Chris Carter and Randy Moss during that course in time. So Dante had the benefit of having a strong leader and, and a father figure in a Dennis Green and had that, that same type of, that's my uncle or that's my brother with those receivers. Yeah. The, the reality of it is, is it's going to ultimately come back to is there enough leadership is there enough structure to create a an environment that can can make it uh, conducive to success for Baker Mayfield hiring can be a slow process Cafe Altura CEO Dylan Miskowitz needed to hire a director of coffee for his organic coffee company but he was having trouble finding qualified applicants so he switched to ZipRecruiter ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you, it finds them for you. Its technology identifies people with the right experience and invites them to apply to your job so you get qualified candidates fast. Dylan posted his job on ZipRecruiter and said he was impressed by how quickly he had great candidates apply. He also used ZipRecruiter's candidate rating feature to filter his applicants so he could focus on the most relevant ones. And that's how Dylan found his new director of coffee in just a few days. With results like that, it's no wonder four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. See why ZipRecruiter is effective for businesses of all sizes. Try ZipRecruiter for free at our web address, ZipRecruiter.com speak. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash S-P-E-A-K. ZipRecruiter.com slash speak. 
ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Whitlock and Wiley, Reggie Bush and LeVar Arrington are back time now for a big story. Let's move to Richard Sherman. Sure, sure. Who made waves last night telling Mike Silver of NFL.com that Baker Mayfield disrespected him by refusing to shake hands How dare before you. the 49ers drubbing of the Browns. But today, new video has emerged showing that Mayfield shook all the Niners' hands at the coin toss, including Sherman. Mm. And the corner now appears to be changing his story with the SI's Albert Breer tweeting, quote, asked uh, Richard Sherman about the video out there. He said it was Baker Mayfield darting away after the toss that angered the Niners. That's it. They are making way too big of a story out of a blowout. He pissed us off. We put a foot in his ass. End of story. <laughs> Damn. I mean, really, that's what he wanted to say. Sure. Like, it wasn't even about the handshake. Sure. It was more so about, <laughs> listen, bro, you ain't even, you're not even ready for this. Mm. Is this a bad look for Richard Sherman? Nah, it's not a bad look. What? Richard Sherman. It's not. All right, well, one, we got to take them through the coin toss. I don't think a lot of people know the beats of a coin toss. Yeah. You could, you get out there. Now, it's all depending on if the referee's ready. If he ain't ready, what's up, boy? All right, boy, <laughs> right, good right, game, good right. game. Go get it. Yeah. Then we do the coin toss. After that, we have to do it again. There's two handshakes. It's two There's handshakes. Two handshakes. Uh, and if you don't there give him the two. second one, then I'm like, oh. The okay, first, game on. The first Thank handshake you. is the only one required here. That's it. That's it. That's Second it. handshake is you my dog. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah, my yeah, dog. Yeah, yeah. Like, exactly. right, you my dog. Yeah. Right. If I don't bang with you like that, I don't bang with but you. But it's like, on it's on the production sheet as a line item. And it's optional. But if you don't take that option, some guys may feel slighted. I feel like Sherman just had it kind of had it out for the young boys. I'm already there. doing this to the crowd. When that <laughs> when that when that coin toss and they say this and going that way, defense is coming out. I'm already looking at the crowd like, yeah! Right. Right, I'm not right. trying to shake your hand. This is a classic situation of uh, Richard Sherman felt slighted because he didn't feel like he got the love yeah. from Baker Mayfield that he should have got. Like, I'm Richard Sherman, dog. You better like, recognize. You better, you better address yeah. me differently than what you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. Plus, you want to get yourself ready to play a game. And if that's what got him a little bit more motivated, yeah. I don't look at it as a bad look. I just look at it as that was his motivation. Right. And then also keep it on the football field. You know what I mean? Because I think the art of the battles, right, between from person to person has kind of been lost with the generation. Like, we don't really see guys, like, mm -hmm. going at each other anymore. Like, mm -hmm. no, nah, I'm on this football field for to you. be you. I'm here That's for you. That's it. I'm only yes. here for you and only you. So, to me, I kind of chalked this up. I think Sherm just kind of had it out for the young dude because oh. Cleveland is Cleveland's been kind of nominated as this great team. Nobody was really picking the 49ers, right? And so he kind of maybe felt disrespected, like, oh, y'all think y'all gonna come cut. in here? You're gonna take, I'm a, gonna take a deeper cut. Sweet. Uh -oh. yeah. I, I'm a, <laughs> because uh -oh. there's a journalist involved here named Michael Silver, who I've known for mm -hmm. my entire career. Connected to the Niners. Yeah. Sports Illustrated, connected yeah. to the Niners, but also connected to Hugh Jackson. Sure. Just being all the way there. Yeah. And and Mike Silver is as woke as anybody on the planet. Fair. Mm. He is a social justice warrior mm -hmm. to the ultimate. And so if he has a chance, and again, I like Mike Silver. He's a good guy. He's a very talented journalist. But the combination of friendship with Hugh, too woke and let's embarrass this little privileged, arrogant white quarterback, mm. that plays for Mike Silver. And then you throw in Richard Sherman. And again, because he said this in private, to Mike Silver. Mm, mm. This feels mm. concocted. It's a bad look for Richard Sherman, Mike Silver. Mm. Again, because this, the second handshake is optional. I get where they're coming from. Right. But, but again, when you try to smear Baker Mayfield, this is kicking a man when he's down. You just knocked him down in the fight. Right. You don't got to come out and talk smack about him afterwards in an unfair way for people to pile on. It, it's, un, it's unfair. And it's convenient. Let's talk mm -hmm. about that. All right, now we, all right, we gonna cook this up together. Yeah. I get it. There's confirmation bias coming in if you're Richard Sherman. You're already loaded, because this is Baker Mayfield, mm -hmm. Mr. All-Hype team right now, <laughs> right? Now, if I do anything against Mr. All-Hype, like he did, got a pick on him, oh, I could really blow this thing up and let everybody know I'm back. Yeah. Richard Sherman's back from there the Achilles. Go. There you go. Undefeated 49ers are back. There you go. And we have, as he said post-game, all pros and pro bowlers on every single level. We here. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, why would Richard Sherman do that? Why would Richard Sherman even, quote, unquote, cloud chase? Sherman blew up. He was already big, but he blew up when he had that battle with yeah, Crabtree, yeah, Crabtree and took it off the field with Aaron Andrews and let the whole world know this is what's going on in the Lions' den. Yeah. Yeah. So he did this once again. 
And it's interesting that Baker Mayfield played right into Play right this into it. Because yeah. that's the reason why people were telling you, look, crawl before you walk, <laughs> homie. Because if not, as you said, you're going to be a lightning rod and people are going to use you for juice. And he just got used for juice. Wow. And, and Nick Bosa, right? Nick Bosa mm. waving the flag afterward, mm. planting yeah, the everybody, flag. Everybody, 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 everybody wants, wants a shot at Baker right Everybody's now. Everybody's making their name off of Baker Mayfield. And, mm-hmm. and I say this mm. uh, affectionately and proudly. Right. Colin Cowherd. Been killing Baker Mayfield. Mm-hmm. Good for Colin Cowherd's brand. He's being proven right. Again, if you're a lightning rod, man, you prepare for a lot of thunderstorms, man. <laughs> you're a polarizing figure. People are going to mm-hmm. do this to you. And so I think Richard Sherman's wrong here, but I'm not going to throw no pity parties for Baker Mayfield. Yeah, I, I think a lot of this, though, what you just said, might have went over a lot of people's heads. And, and the reality of it is, is that when you look at what just took place and the source in which it came from and how it was put out there. I mean, I don't, the reason I'll continue to say I don't think it's really bad on, on Richard Sherman is because, for one, we have come to know Richard Sherman to be a lightning rod, yeah. for one. He, yeah, has no, yeah. he has no problem being a polarizing yeah. figure. Mm-mm, so, mm-mm. so when you have a, a, a known polarizing figure that, that is willing to speak his mind, um, I don't think that that's a bad look. And then, and then the reality of it is, is that he's one of those rare guys that he'll talk crazy and you'll think it's crazy. But he backs it up. Yeah, he backs it up. I mean, he went out there and got, he picked the dude off. Well, he had a good yeah, game. I, I think I, no, There's it's some not cloud a bad chasing look. going on, though. Oh, for sure. We <laughs> should be talking about the 49ers, not Richard Sherman. trying to get that Hall beauty, of Fame bit. But the beauty of Richard Sherman, as you said, is he's been through the highs and lows of being this guy that yeah. Baker's trying to be. He's yeah. like, right now, bro, learn from a vet. Yeah. Talk that talk now. And as you see, Baker Mayfield has a different personality right now. Whitlock and Wiley joined now by Fox NBA analyst Catino Mobley. All right, let's move to the NBA. Where Rockets general manager Daryl Morey stirred controversy this week by tweeting support for protesters in Hong Kong. The Chinese government was displeased with Morey and with Adam Silver's support of the general manager. And the Chinese state TV canceled preseason broadcasts while other Chinese companies have suspended business with the NBA. People across the league are having to navigate the international incident and yesterday, the normally outspoken Steve Kerr was asked if he had an opinion on the controversy. Actually, I don't. I mean, it's a, it's a really, it's a really bizarre international story, and um, a lot of us are, you know, don't know what to make of it. So um, it's, it's something I'm reading about, and uh, just like everybody is, but I'm not going to comment further than that. All right, the question here is, do you like how the NBA is handling this controversy? No. Uh, it's, it's a difficult one, man. But are we surprised? This is inevitable. Um, if you talk about what they're doing in terms of business, it's understandable. Like, you're working with China. They have a population of 1.4 billion people. That's why every single business that's into the profit is going to try and work with China. But you also have to ask yourself, what does that mean in terms of relationship and in terms of agreement? So when people come up to me and always say, the end justifies the means, I'm like, I raise an eyebrow. I'm like, do you understand what the means are? And in this situation, this is something that Adam Silver and NBA is dealing with that they didn't start, that is bigger than them. And now they're trying to do their best to put that toothpaste back in that tube. And what's going on is they're fighting a fight that is not their fight. And they're trying to do it to preserve a relationship that is not built on the strongest character and the fundamentals that they represent. So, as I said before, I think this was inevitable. Daryl Morey sent in a tweet was now the reason why we're having this discussion. But when you're talking about the U.S.-China relationships and then you try to morph that into a business relationship of the NBA, blurred lines will occur. Yeah, it's, it's very tricky, though, right? <clears throat> yeah. At the end of the day, uh, Adam Silver, I think, is a great commissioner. Um, he, he is diplomatic about we'll a lot of different things. Put that into issues. the record. Adam Silver, you're a good commissioner. Continue. Uh, uh, mm. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, obviously, you want to say, obviously, you want to say something. But anyway, yes, like, like I was saying, um, you got to think about this. First of all, Daryl Morey, I don't know how influential or, or how many times or what you have done or being in Hong Kong or China or whatever it is, you are a GM for the Houston Rockets. So to be able to state that, it's very sensitive. You don't, you're, not, you're not there. You're not in China. You're not in Hong Kong. You're not over there. So to be able to stay, 
fight for freedom, stand. Like that's like V, v for well, Vendetta. You, you're inspiring individuals, you, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I'm gonna give you something to react go ahead, to. Go ahead, I'm gonna give you something to react to. Mm -hmm. Listen, the NBA is strangling on its own hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. They've branded themselves as the social justice league, mm -hmm. the most progressive league, mm -hmm. we care about all the, everything. Mm -hmm. And Daryl Morey has tweeted out support of democracy. Mm -hmm. That's something that I think most Americans have a consensus on. We right. believe in democracy. Okay. And we don't believe in communism and repressive government. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think th the NBA needs to be more honest about what it is. It's a business, a cold-hearted business. Mm -hmm. And there's a ton of money to be made in China. Right. That's why every NBA player runs his ass over to China mm -hmm. two or three times every summer to get the bag. Right. The NBA's been over there getting the bag. And right. a, that's one of the reasons why NBA salaries have escalated to such a high level. And so the problem that people are having is like the NBA, Steve Kerr, Greg Popovich, mm -hmm. uh, LeBron James, mm -hmm. nobody wants to visit the White House. Everybody's very critical of the American mm -hmm. government. Mm -hmm. But here we have a communist repressive government mm -hmm. that human rights violations out the yin yang. Okay. Daryl Moy, innocent little tweet here, and no one can stand by him for business purposes. I, so quit faking the funk. We, there's no faking the funk just one. Just be a business. There's no faking the funk one. And two, I understand what you're speaking of. Well, when, when, we, when we take a stand, as far as in America, Steve Kerr, Greg Popovich, LeBron, whoever it is, myself, you, whoever it is, that's in our backyard. This is not our backyard. That's one. No, that's two where you is, get your money Two from. is that 600 million people watching Chinese, that's over in China, that's watching NBA basketball. 600 million. Uh, Wait, 200 million more than America. Yeah. So you, now what you're doing is you're biting them hands. They're feeding you. So, so first of all, stay away from that. Stay away from it. Because if, you, if, you're, if, you're, sung, if you're so gung-ho, your name will be with Steve Kerr and, and Greg Popovich when it comes to what's in America. Do you tweet a lot of those things that's in America that's going on? I don't see you doing that, but you tweet those type of things that's maybe uproar and doing X, Y, and Z over there in um, Asia. I've said this earlier in the week about the Kansas controversy with Snoop. I'm standing on it, repeat it again. The shoe companies control basketball. Mm -hmm. And the shoe companies are really in bed with China mm -hmm. and are really trying to get the bag from China. Okay. And so all that some people are saying is like, cut it out. NBA, Adam Silver, Steve Kerr. You guys are not political activists. You're not social justice activists. I don't think that's You're what business doing. people. I don't think that's because what Because when doing. China tells you to shut the hell up, everybody shuts the hell up. I don't everybody think... loses their courage when there's money on the line. And we crucified the NFL mm -hmm. for protecting its bag. When they say, hey, man, this kneeling thing's hurting us ratings-wise, and we're a business here trying to do a TV show, we crucified the NFL. But now the NBA tries to protect this, and everybody, everybody, cat got my tongue. But what yeah. is he protecting? Well, look, the, the, what is he really, well, look, what is he really saying? China was able to flex their muscles and get mm -hmm. the NBA to not only say, okay, we believe in freedom of expression, just not what he expressed. <laughs> so, like, look, now, you, look, we yeah. have conflating issues right here. Like you said, in our own backyard, when it was the issue in Charlotte, mm -hmm. the NBA flexed his muscle. Mm -hmm. But then we knew why. Because home base, that's home base. Home base, home base, and also you control the end game. Right. You control the bag. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to China, you're compromising yourself to a degree mm -hmm. because you know you want the bag. You want mm -hmm. that end game. So. It's, it's a real question of not only he said, what is your political ceiling? Because if you're going to act like that everyone could be woke and talk in politics, then to what extreme? Because right now you just got compromised. And two, what is true diversity? The NBA always talks about how diverse it is. Mm -hmm. But diversity to most people is black and white. Mm -hmm. They all understand it's not just that. It's, right. it's not just socioeconomics. It's not just your race. It's also your belief system. Mm -hmm. So in true diversity, are you really going to open yourselves up and express that we are also going to be supportive of what China's mindset is. It's so complicated. It's just funny they got in bed with a situation that now they're mad that they're lying. It is, it is very complicated, but I think Adam Silver, the way he's taking it for me, I'm a humanist. I think you're a humanist. Humanist. Yeah, okay. Adam Silver's a humanist. So it's not like I'm so gung-ho way on one side. Adam Silver's I'm just saying, job mm -hmm. is to make money. And everybody's job is to make no, money. No, 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 no. But he's got a big paycheck 
to, that's demanding that. He, there's more pressure on him. But let's not and act so like right, he doesn't do this, period. He's, right a, he's now, a diplomatic he's, person, correct? He's not being Is a he not human. a diplomatic person? He's being a businessman. Right, right. And again, they need to quit faking the fun. The NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, the National Hockey League, they're businesses. Did you hear what Tillman said, too? Right? For T... You uh, yeah. Yeah. What did he... I mean, he's like, listen, he don't rep he's not representing what we're saying as individuals <laughs> because it's a big picture. It's a big picture. You and somebody else's yard speaking about something you really truthfully may not know nothing about. Agreed. That's all, all right. I'm saying. Well, again, I, let's just be clear here. I, I, crystal clear. Mm -hmm. It's not a controversial, complicated issue. Mm -hmm. Either you're for democracy mm -hmm. or you're for communism. That's the only debate here. They're, they're not... Uh, uh, Daryl Morey wasn't trying to dig into the details of what's going on in China and Hong Kong. All he was supporting was democracy and freedom. That's not a controversial topic but, here in America. It is over in China. Mm -hmm. He's not trying to tell the Chinese government how to operate. He just expressed support for democracy. That's not a controversial issue but among us. But it became us. third rail because of their control of the state press, and they now say a pro-democracy tweet is a separatist movement support tweet because mm -hmm. they control mm -hmm. the messaging mm -hmm. out there. And that's when you realize you, you just jumped in the wrong backyard. Yeah, that's it's, all My thing is, is it's fine that you can say it to yourself. You can say it, among, but to be able to put it out there, anything when it comes to politics, there's always different sides. It's like his, hers, and the real side, right? So at the end of the day, when you put something out there, you have to understand that some people may not like it. And Daryl, he may... Not saying he made a mistake because he didn't, but he at the end of the day, right? At the end of the day, it's 1.4 billion people, because, right? Again, Twitter is not the right place there for you serious go. You're discussion. Right. You're right. Period, You're right. To You're express right. anything on, and he made a mistake. And the biggest mistake he's made is he's opening people's minds to who's really influencing right. and calling the shots in the NBA. Mm -hmm. It's not who you think. Mm -hmm. When you become a global business mm -hmm. and you start accepting money from all around the world, mm -hmm. you start accepting their influence and their values mm -hmm. start getting fed into yours. And that's why, again, and this is where Adam Silver's scared this is gonna go. You wonder why so many of these athletes seem to have Marxist, communist points of view. They're not even aware, mm -hmm. but trust me, some of us who are actually old enough and have studied enough are like, man, you're expressing some Marxist communist stuff. They're not even aware of it. Mm -hmm. But it's the China it's a little season shoe to company it. influence mm -hmm. that's doing all of this. And so they, they've opened a can of worms yeah. here. Time now for Darnell's question of the day. I brought an extra stress bottle of Twitter off of this. Extra stress? Uh, oh, yeah. Sure I, 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 I <laughs> filled up on my Twitter off. Let's Darnell, go. go ahead. Yeah, let's move to Penn State, where a controversy we has are. erupted. <laughs> After mm. defensive back Jonathan Sutherland received a fan letter criticizing him for his hairstyle, Penn State's coach James Franklin offered a unifying message of support in response. And one of Sutherland's teammates, Antonio Sheldon, tweeted out the letter, which reads, quote, Watching the Idaho game on TV, we couldn't help but notice your, well, awful hair. Surely, there must be mirrors in the locker room. Don't you have parents or a girlfriend who told you that shoulder-length dreadlocks look, look disgusting and are certainly not attractive? We congratulate you on your game against Pitt, but you need to remember you represent all Penn Staters, both current and those alumni from years past. We will welcome the reappearance of dress codes for athletes. You will certainly be playing on Sunday in the future, but we have stopped watching the NFL due to, due to the disgusting tattoos awful hair and immature antics in the end zone. Players should act as though they've been there before. I want to ask you guys, do you like how Penn State is handling this? All right, let me enter into the record how Penn State is handling it. One, a couple of Sutherland's teammates tweeted out the letter, mm -hmm. including the guy's name. A lot of people then went after the guy that wrote the letter. He had to delete his Facebook account. James Franklin today mm. started out his press conference with a statement, not addressing the letter, but talking about the values of Penn State and how they're inclusive and for everybody, and went on to explain what a great young man Sutherland is, captain, leader of the team, on the dean's list, someone James Franklin said he hoped his daughter would marry someone of his character. Having said all that, Woo. my initial reaction is just like, man, this is an old man saying some old man stupid stuff. Mm -hmm. I get that letter and I crumple it up and throw it in the trash and I laugh with my teammates about it. I don't think it's a devastating experience. 
No. Yeah, that my initial reaction is the same because I put myself in that position. And I've been in that position before, as we all have gotten fan mail, mm -hmm. and fan mail has to be separated from. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, I'll sign this. Oh, that's glowing. Thank <laughs> you. And to here they go. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yep. And I wish we didn't amplify ignorance. Uh, this is a fan, not the fan base, but I digress. Let's talk about how Penn State is handling this. One, I don't like that the teammate tweets out a letter of someone else on his team. Let that guy be so offended. Be that the subject who of the letter was, they were speaking about in the letter, I should say, and let him be the one that starts this. Um, instead, it's a teammate and other people. So I think you look at it beyond that point in Penn State and them acknowledging it and having their statement read today, but not necessarily taking the Q&A on this. Yeah. It's just unfortunate because now you've given a complexion to your fan base that I don't think that is truly an example of what that fan base is. But we are, which I never heard before, not a Penn State fan. It's all respect. right. Um, now yeah. it's going to be accompanied by a situation like this, and I think that's unfortunate. You want oh, no, you go ahead. I'm waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting on you, Penn State. I don't know the source in which this this mail came from, but we do know that it's an older man. So what I'll say is there's like two two different parts to this. There, the, there's the part where the school um, addresses it, the, the part where the, the head coach addresses it. I commend the addressing of it because you didn't ignore something that was relevant within the community. That's first and foremost. Secondly, I, I commend the way that that, that even the school, when they, they posted on the, the particular player's um, thread, they posted that, you know, their statement that they did not support the, the ideas and thoughts within the, the letter. Now, with that being said, I don't think that they needed to do any more than what they did. You address it very, very quickly and move on from it because it shouldn't have been a big deal to, to me, to be honest. And, and here's, here's where I'll go on the other side of it with, with the other the other category the other category is is where is that where is that coming from to mm. say you're a Penn Stater you're representing more than yourself you're representing the the alumni now I have a unique ability to be able to provide perspective on that because I, I played there mm -hmm. the reality that that struck me when I read that part of the letter and and this might make a lot of people upset and, and I'm sorry, but, you know, I always shoot from the hip. And I know everybody's sitting there like, oh, what is LeVar about say to say? It. I'm saying it. All right, here we go. <laughs> the, reality, the reality here is that is very much the culture that Joe Paterno built. Mm -hmm. The culture of you, when you come to this school, all right, I came to that school. I, I'm, a, I'm a kid from the city of Pittsburgh. I'm a Pittsburgh, I'm a Pittsburgh born and bred dude. That's city. That's urban. You come to this school and now you're not allowed to wear earrings. You're not allowed to have facial hair. You're, you're, you know, there is the, the idea it's of- the New York Yankees. Uh, right, yeah. so, or the, the, yeah, that. or the blue dude. Or anywhere blue Tom Devils, Coughlin or, is. Right, yeah, or four. Tom Coughlin, <laughs> yeah. right? So the, the, the ideology of if it doesn't fit the mold of what it is that, that is, is acceptable, um, then it's disgusting, then it is inappropriate, it is incorrect, it's not right. The reason why it was, it's been so, so embraced and because it, it became such a fabric of Penn State is because of the type of success that Penn Staters have been able to have outside of the game of football. We, we have Grammy Award winners and musicians, you know, very successful people, and that mold is is a mold that lives in the past of of Penn State's history. So what you're seeing here is a disconnect. Those kids that that young men that that saw the letter was offended by the letter, which they should have been offended by the letter. Yep. They know nothing about Joe Paterno. Joe Paterno's been gone. Mm -hmm. They know in, they know they may know some of the things that happened in that past, but they don't they're not connected to that past. The the coach is not connected to that past. So to me, when I look at this situation, you're looking at the old versus the new. The new has to do what the new is doing in order to be able to compete and be competitive in the line that they're in. You're not going to be able to beat Ohio State. You're not going to be able to compete with Alabama. You're not going to be able to play those teams unless you get some kids that come from a different culture than what you have been comfortable seeing. 
You know, I'm a dreadlock myself. I've had dread. I know. I have dealt with that. I, I would just want to summarize a bit of what you're saying in terms of Penn State has a brand. Mm -hmm. And their uniforms Plain. fit that brand. Plain. It's about not drawing attention to an individual. We are bigger than all the individual parts. Yeah. And again, what this old man's saying is stupid and shouldn't have been written in a letter. However, I asked the kids, and you're giving them, letting them off the hook, but I asked the kids, like, do y'all know what school y'all committed to? Mm. This is Penn State. This is the mentality. But why, the but why do we always have to attack a black person's hair? Like, why do we have to attack somebody's dreads? Because that's the form, because that's the way they want to wear their hair. Mm. Because I think this old white man would attack a white young man he with would. long hair. I because don't know I, him, but... I, 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 we don't know I, that because this is what we I got in front of Well, us. again, I don't think this guy referenced race at all. I don't... I, I wish that we as black people would quit putting so much emphasis on our hair. I don't know any other ethnic group who takes some sort of pride in whether white people wear their hair feathered, whether they... whatever, uh, crew cut, whatever, but we seem to place this huge emphasis on how we wear our hair. Because we're any... always asked to cut our hair. Oh, well, no, no, well, you know what's interesting nah. about that? Woo! This is why this issue was big. And James Franklin, Penn State, wanted to, to squash this before they have something of greater magnitude on their hands. Um, I'll answer this by story, but let me tell you about these kids. One thing about the kids is when you know yourself, others' issues are their issues. Mm -hmm. When you don't know yourself, the other's issue seem like it's your issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So someone could throw you a grenade, and if you have a strong sense of identity and security, yeah. I understand they're younger, but throw it back, because it's not yours. Mm -hmm. But if you hold it and say, why'd you throw this at me? I'm just telling you now, you're going to have to grow out of that mentality. I played with a guy, O.J. Santiago. Not many people may know him, uh, tight end, who had dreads. We lived together, eight of us in a training apartment coming out the draft. One day, OJ's like, cut these off. We're like, why you want to cut them off? Man, I think it could help me in the draft. It wasn't a long conversation. This was a young man who said he wanted to help himself in the draft, just like we were working out to help ourselves in the draft. Mm -hmm. he, we took it, and he took it as a matter of fact. Why? That could be a greater issue. I don't think it helped him in the draft. I think right. it just was. Right. But the point is, this situation right now, the way Penn State handled it, I didn't like because they started to justify who the kid was. The overcorrection from James Franklin was, he's from a two-parent home. You don't have to He's do articulate. Yeah. This is the kid I want to marry right. my daughter. What the hell? Right. What if he wasn't? Right. What if he only had one parent? What if he's from the hood? Right. What if he's damn near on the borderline of flunking out? Now the dress means something different, and that's us taking the grenade and letting it stay on our lap instead of throwing hell it Hell of a point, Marcellus. And I just... Look, man, old people are stuck in their ways. Mm -hmm. When I got my ear pierced at like 20, my father didn't like it. Mm -hmm. yeah. If I had dreadlocks, my father wouldn't like it. Mm -hmm. And trust, my father had a total black existence. Total. Lived in the hood with black people, built a business in the hood, built a brand new home in the hood. He, he, white people were a non-issue for him. We keep just like, oh my God, somebody white doesn't like my hair, mm. I'm gonna melt. Because no they don't way. understand it. That's why. Because white people don't grow dreads, period. So they don't, they, he don't, he I just, still they think don't understand. As a, Trevor Lawrence think has this, long hair, and that old white dude probably don't like it either. But I think in this mm. scenario... He ain't saying it to Trevor Lawrence, though, He's is he? not a Clemson fan. In this scenario, <laughs> there, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of people that, that ride with the beliefs and ideas of Joe Paterno. And, and this, to me, I don't know the, the source. I don't know him. And I don't vouch for it, but the reality of it is, is if, if I'm listening to a voice, I can think of at least five to ten people off the top of my head that would have said something like that in this manner and had no malice and, and no no yes. type of... Hold on, hold on. Yes. No no type of real, real type of... There, it, it isn't about race. Mm -hmm. it, the, the race, like the, the story of We Are comes from the fact that we are meant that we're not playing this game unless our brother Triplett, who was a black man that they were trying to segregate from being able to play in the game with the white players, was allowed to play with their team. We are standing together. Now, I know we are may mean something different to, to the deuces over here in USC, but what it represented in Penn State was we're sticking together, black, white, 
I don't care. We're a team. And I think the, the, the principles that have been built on that, that I saw and I, 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 I looked at, it, it doesn't go any further than him saying that you are representing something bigger than yourself. You are representing a tradition. You are representing legacies. You're, you're representing a, a place where not only did I go here, but my daughter and my son went here. My, my son's son went here. My son's son's daughter went here. You're talking about generations. So that's why I'm saying we can look at the letter itself and say, okay, this is egregious. This is offensive. And it may well, very well be. And, and I have no problem with somebody internalizing it that way. But if you look at it at its bare minimum, at its bare root, and you say, okay, here are generations. This generation of Penn Staters represent this. This generation of Penn Staters represent this, just like anything or anywhere else. This is a representation of somebody who's saying, you represent Penn State, the school. Because I can guarantee you right now, there are, I was having this conversation the other day, there are, probably older Penn Staters that are looking at our current players on that and they look nothing like the Penn Staters that were on on our team when I was there and they're probably feeling a certain type of way about how their hair is or if they have earrings in or facial hair that those things are That's very not real how he said it though he said well your hair is awful don't you have a mirror don't you have a parent or girlfriend who told you those shoulder length dreads that's look rude and stupid. disgusting? It, that's not that's rude. not how he said it. But so Reg, it is the it, whole thing. If stupid, you're looking at it the whole way, it, it's still in a parent. My grandma a saw me come uh, home with a nose ring, and she said, "Boy, first of all, she was like, are you still a boy?" And I was like, "Grandma." Then she was like, "It's stupid. It's ugly." Then she saw Tupac have it. She was like, "Oh, that's cool." <laughs> Point being, it don't make that damn much sense. It's just a difference, okay. man. LeVar Arrington, former Penn Thank State you. great for oh, yeah. Washington Redskins, second <laughs> overall pick. Come on, get some uh, Come on, come on. Come on. Come on. Private <laughs> Lee, come yeah, over to yeah. oh, helicopters. He's back with First us. First haircut yesterday. Yeah. All right. Let's also go. joined by former Western Michigan <laughs> <laughs> great. Yeah. 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 All right, let's move to hey, Dallas. Stay away from here, man. Where the Cowboys are <laughs> regrouping after Sunday night's ugly <laughs> loss to the Packers. At Jerry World, Dallas has now dropped two straight, and some are speculating that Jason, Ge Jason Garrett may be on the hot seat. But Jerry Jones dismissed the idea on his weekly radio show appearance, saying anyone who bets that Garrett will be fired is going to lose their money. Jason Garrett's going to be fired, <laughs> so I'm gonna, I ain't losing my money. Mm. Buying that Jared, uh, Jason Garrett is not on the hot seat, of course he's on the hot seat. Yeah. He ain't got no contract after this. If that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Lame duck defined is hot seat. Every move you make, every step you take. They watching you, brother. And that's <laughs> yes, what's indeed. happening right now. So he's not going to get fired. They're just going to let his contract run out and be like, deuces. Oh, he's going to get fired. No, he's yeah. not getting fired this year. He's playing this oh, all the he, way through. He's going to get fired this year. He won't get fired during the season? No. I don't think he'll get fired during the season. So, he is definitely on the hot seat. Anytime your expectations are NFC Championship, Super Bowl, or bust, mm -hmm. and you don't get to that, mm -hmm. literally, he hasn't. he's won two playoff games. Yeah. He's won two playoff games. Like, he's been given chance after chance, and it's just in the expectations of this team are too great and too high for them to come anywhere underneath that. But he's getting fired. That means he's not going to finish the season. You're saying that? I'm no. predicting. No, I no don't way. think it he will happen this season. No way. I think he'll make it out the season. But I think he'll get fired after. Contract, it's over, though. Contract's over. You can't fire somebody who don't have a contract. Thank you. I mean, Semantics, I'm, but it's real. It's, uh, it is very true. And, and listen, I think he is on the hot seat, obviously. Again, when you pay that type of money that you paid out to Zeke, you're going to be leveraged into paying that to your quarterback, possibly. You, you have it into your defense, your offensive line. You have to win with the pieces that you have yes. in place. If you don't win, you should be on the hot seat. And the reality of it is, is this is one of those seasons where it's you're saying, I've been here long enough. You've been here long enough to say you know the lay of the land. You know you've been here as a coordinator. You've been here as a player. You know the lay of the land. We've given you the pieces that you want. you got to win now. And, and it, it really just comes down to that. And will he make it out of the season? That's that's Yes. Yes. I think if they have a very, very bad fall, if they have a very bad run, they, I mean, they, you can't do Jets any worse. Jets getting than clipped this weekend, and it's a possibility. Jets got some players coming back, not just Sam Darnold. If this, if he doesn't right this ship and they somehow trick off this game to the Jets, 
He can get clipped this weekend. Ooh, mm. I don't think he'll lose it after this weekend, but it certainly Easy. could start the process. The process the of, process of been filling started. him in. Well, <laughs> well, then he could get clipped after the Jets game. Then. Man, they fall to three and three I, and I, lose I, to the I, Jets. Look, how many playoff games did Bill Parcells win as a Dallas Cowboy coach? I'll wait. Uh, yeah, but. I know he ain't Parcells, but he's there, to, he's there so that Jerry Jones doesn't have to share the credit. He's there to manage the personalities. He's there to keep things clean in terms of decorum. He's doing a good job in that. He just needs to win more more in the playoffs. You got to get to the playoffs to win more in the playoffs. So why would you clip him before you can see if he can realize what you want, Jerry, in the playoffs? You can't cut him before. He's been to the playoffs only three three I seasons. I know, but he, he only had this two, team almost well, twice. Times. He's only been to, he's to won, the playoffs once. Twice. Won, right. yeah, he's okay. won right. twice. Right. He's been there three times. With this team? That, no, that's, but I, that, you don't. And that's what makes it different. Right. That, no. This, this, this roster makes it. Vi- <laughs> what you the roster to? and the paycheck connected to this team is, is, is it's different. different. This entire offseason. What, he paid five guys this offseason? Jalen Smith, more? Demarcus Lawrence, O-line, Zeke. Zeke, come on, Th- man. There are so many coaches that are establishing a culture and a roster and a personnel that they don't get to live out and see. F- to go to fruition. Great. They don't get, the, I mean, yeah. we. so we're going to just wait and see, okay, we'll give you three more extended seasons after this. No. Just to see. His no. contract runs on I, at the end of the I year. I get that. We're giving you to the end of the year. You're on the hot seat. That means you want to stay here longer, win in the playoffs. You don't? All right. Tap out. He's got to have six. He's got to have, he can't have a winning season. He has to have real success. Now, how that's defined by Jerry Jones and the rest of the guys in that brain trust, I don't know. But he has to have real success. That's what's going to define whether he keeps his job or not. Whitlock and Wiley, LeVar Arrington is back with us. Let's move to LeVar's old team. Oh, here we go. Redskins. <laughs> it is your okay. old team. Yeah. Who fired Jay Gruden Monday do. after five-plus lackluster seasons at the helm. Reportedly, the team's wish list of candidates to replace Gruden includes one huge name, Steelers head coach Mike Tomlin. And while things in Pittsburgh haven't been great for Tomlin in the last couple of years, things in Washington haven't been good for anybody for the last two decades. Since Daniel Snyder bought the team in 1999, the Redskins have had nine head coaches, 20 starting quarterbacks, and just two postseason wins. Mike Tomlin was asked about the Redskins' rumors today. Mm. I'm the head coach of a one in four football team that's going on the road to play a Hall of Fame caliber quarterback with my third quarterback. You think I'm worried about anything this week other than that? All right. Should Mike Mm. Tomlin be interested in the Redskins job? Uh, That new wave interest where you only show interest publicly just to drive your price up when you are on the free market. But in real interest, hell no. Do not. I mean, No, no, it, there's no stability in that position. Look, you can say, that, hey, Jay Gruden was there for six years and, and wasn't doing a tremendous job, so you can call that stability, but not when you're Mike Tomlin, not when you potentially may leave the Pittsburgh Steelers three coaches in, what, 51 years? I'm not leaving that stability to go somewhere unstable like that. I would sit that out if this is a reality for Mike Tomlin. Yeah, I mean, I think you should always be interested in what an opportunity is that presents itself for you and, and gain the information that, that surrounds it. But if, if you're logically and sensibly looking at what your situation is, um, if, you're, if you're still welcome and, and you're still in Pittsburgh and your heart is still, still there, I think that you're best serving yourself to try to repair and fix or rebuild or redo, reboot what you have going on where you're at because the structure is there. And I think, again, there are very few teams in the National Football League that are franchises. There are more teams than there are franchises. He happens to be a coach for a franchise. I would be more, I would be more apt to trying to figure out how do I maintain what I have here and try to build that and maintain that. Can't, maybe it can't be maintained. 12 years is a long time in the modern NFL. Look, Andy Reid left Philadelphia, reinvented himself in Kansas City, is having a nice run in Kansas City. The reason I don't like the Redskins job for Mike Tomlin, even though that's his hometown, it's his hometown Mm -hmm. team, it's an Mm -hmm. area, I get it. I think Atlanta is the spot. If I were Mike Tomlin and looking to reinvent myself, I would go coach for Arthur Blank, who I think is a very solid NFL owner. Uh, and I think and I think Mike Tomlin could make a difference in Atlanta quicker than he could with Washington. I, I think that Matt Ryan, although obviously not the MVP Matt Ryan, there's still something there. You want to have a quarterback when you're the head coach. 
So that's why I wouldn't, if I'm going to leave Pittsburgh, I'm going to a better situation than Washington. I'd be trying to get to Atlanta. You know, another interesting point to raise, and I did fail to mention that his family is in D.C. Yeah. Um, you know, what's interesting is, is that there was one coach that came into Washington that actually had what it took to turn the, the, the ship around. And it takes a lot to turn a ship around. Mm -hmm. It can't turn on a dot. It takes time to move it. Um, Mike Tomlin has the pedigree to be able to turn that franchise around. That would not be the reason why I would say lean towards not going there. The reason I would say would be more based upon when I saw Marty come in there and Marty came in there to change the culture that was early on what the Redskins culture had become, they got rid of him. He didn't go, they didn't get rid of him for anything else other than they could not deal with the type of personality that was coming to the table to change this culture into a winning culture. No. I think Tomlin could do that, but it would be a very it would probably be problematic and probably end up being a short-lived deal for him there because I just don't think that leadership would be able to handle him. Are you talking in. about Bruce Allen or are you talking about Daniel uh, Snyder? Well, it'd be both. It, well, be again, the I think he of, could maybe get rid of Bruce Allen. It, well, but it would still become the discomfort of, of, of Dan. It, it, if, it, if it becomes something that is uncomfortable where they can't do it the way they want to do it and how they want to do it, like, I'm not here to be your friend because what happens is, is when you hit a certain place in the Redskins organization, it's about everybody being friends, mm. right? We go hang together, we party together, we do everything together. And the reality of it is is that guys like Marty Schottenheimer, he ain't playing that type of game. A guy like Coach Tomlin is not coming in there to be, you know, hanging buddies. I'm coming in here to win, and I think that that would be problematic. Uncle Jimmy's here to help us talk about our approval ratings for Baker Mayfield. You go first. <laughs> go ahead and give Marcellus this big dummy man, of the day. Stop. Hey, go man, ahead. big dummy I, of the day. What's that? Goes to somebody that said, I don't know what our people's infatuation is with hair. <laughs> hey, man, that's why we started doing the big dummy of the day, so you can show people that little half-row you got right there. Half-row? Yeah, he can't get a whole half-row. It's <laughs> just a half-row. Half-row. <laughs> All right, real. let's talk about Baker Mayfield. Tell him it's real, too. No, he yeah. got embarrassed last that. night by the 49ers and will now have to face another NFC West power, hosting Russell Wilson and the Seahawks Sunday. Marcellus, you think Baker gets humbled again this weekend? No, um, it's been inconsistent no. this mm. year, but that means there's been some highs and some lows. Uh, lose, win, lose, win, lose. Just a week ago when they beat the Ravens, when people were talking like, oh, look at Baker Mayfield. So, no, I don't think he gets humbled again. I think he's going to have to dig deep and realize that there's a lot more to this professional game than anticipated, but he'll find. He'll be fine. He'll correct his course. Mm, I'm not. I, again? I, yeah. I, yeah. I think they start serving humble pie. They start serving bigger slices after this. They, he, needed, he needs to be like uh, playing the Jets, like the Cowboys. Like Dak's going to get the feast on the Jets. Mm. Uh, he's playing Seattle and right, Russell he Wilson. Jets. He played them already. Uh, well, get that right. again. Uncle Jimmy, <laughs> look at my take on Baker Mayfield? I'm going to tell you like I always say, humble pie is a dish best served with steak. <laughs> while held lightly over your eye. <laughs> <laughs> Look here, man, let me tell you something. The Baker Mayfield is solely responsible for that fiasco that happened last night in San Francisco. And now, I'm gonna tell you this now, nephew, it behooves me <laughs> to try to figure out what the hell you was thinking that you tried to find some blame with Odell Beckham Jr. and his last night performance. Mm. What? Now, He's look here, oh, well, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Did Odell not play quarterback? Yeah. He running did. back? Yeah, he did. Wide receiver? Yeah. Punt returner? I saw that. Yeah. And was hollering at the cheerleaders on the sideline. <laughs> <laughs> he did it all. Didn't do not it well. Well. Not well. Not well. Now, 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 let what? me tell you where the problem came in at. The problem came in with your boy Faker Mayfield <laughs> when he came in and disrespected Richard Sherman. <laughs> and that's why Sherman told you, hey, I got to put that foot in that ass. <laughs> that was his first mistake. I'm not sure. I think they did shake hands. Look here, man. I don't know what neighborhood you grew up in, but what me and Douglas grew up in, there's some things you don't do. You don't pull on Superman's cape, mm. you don't spit in the wind, mm. and you don't disrespect an OG like Richard Sherman. Mm. Richard Sherman is respected on the field. He's respected in the streets. 
Mm. And he's respected in the beauty salons. <laughs> Y'all believe me? Check his receipts. <laughs> Look at man, you let Faker go up there to Seattle. <laughs> How you do that, dude? <laughs> and you let him go up there and not shake Russell Wilson's hand. <laughs> you let him go up there with all that crotch grabbing and all that dabbing and see what's gonna happen. Uh. Mm. Hey, man, I pray to sweet Mother Mary Black Jesus. I hope that Baker's mic'd up <laughs> so we can hear everything he's saying at the coin toss. <laughs> he's going to be talking about, hey, hey, how are you doing, Mr. Wilson, sir? <laughs> I hope you have a good day today, sir. <laughs> Russell's like, why are you being so nice to me? Oh, I think we show quarterbacks need to stick together, sir. <laughs> Short See, quarterbacks. Need look here, man. <laughs> Baker Mayfield need to quit trying to make it rain, man. Mm. And he just need to concentrate on trying to become rain man. Uh, like Deshaun Watson. Yep. <laughs> now, y'all seen Deshaun Watson breaking down them videotapes? <laughs> he said, I'm talking about, the, well, the play was called Kunta Wright. It was Kunta Wright, but then I had three whites to the right, and then I had one guy coming out the back. I knew that's where I was going to go. <laughs> that's what Baker needs. He needs to get rid of the street smarts and get some football smarts. <laughs> it don't matter how many books you can read if you can't read a defense. Mm, you went Rex Ryan on hey, it. Hey, and right. guess what, Baker? <laughs> Uncle Jimmy ain't even going to charge you for that. <laughs> that one's on the house, baby. Player to player, pimp to pimp. All right, here's my <laughs> approval rating for Baker Mayfield. <laughs> I've got him at a 56 oh, role game's player. Sold, it ain't told, Just baby. barely. Dropping 15 points in job performance all the way down to a 15. Goodness. That's that's most. I dropped him one point well, in all time. You not drive. Yeah, I had to drop him as well. The, the character, authenticity. Cadillac. Yeah, you got to respect the game. You got to respect, like he said, the OGs in the game too. No matter what. Three turnovers, like Marcellus. How you got him at a 12 job performance? Oh, uh, because he was good last week. Oh, remember that? Damn, a week. All right. How many shows? Dumpster fire for the internet. <laughs>